two weeks ago, we began our course of study of the New Testament under the theme, it's all about Jesus. And we looked at the Gospel of Matthew and learned that Matthew speaks about Jesus as the fulfiller of promises. All of the Old Testament prophecies concerning the Messiah are fulfilled in Jesus. Then last week, we looked at the Gospel of Mark and learned that Jesus is the powerful Savior. Today, we're going to consider the next Gospel, Matthew, the fulfiller of promises, two weeks ago, Mark, Jesus, the mighty Savior. And today, we're going to consider the Gospel of Luke and how Luke emphasizes that Jesus is the merciful Savior, the Savior who is filled with love for sinners, for lost people, the Savior who has pity on us all. This is a famous picture of Jesus. It's known as Warner Solomon's Head of Christ. And as you look at this picture, you can see the kind eyes, a rather serious smile, I suppose, half smile. The hair is pretty much in place. And it's one of the most famous pictures of Jesus from recent times. It's the picture that I grew up with. I saw it in our church. I saw it in Sunday school. It's the way I used to think of Jesus looking. In recent years, some computer experts put together a portrait of what they thought a first century Jewish man might look like. And this is what they came up with. Not terribly attractive, not a terribly appealing picture, but this is what they decided a first century man might look like based on all the evidence they had from history and archeology. span Almost looks a little bit frightening. I have to say that my favorite picture of Jesus is this one. And maybe you've seen this one too. It's a famous picture by Richard Hook, a painting by Richard Hook. And it depicts Jesus with some disheveled hair and uh, a generally a less than tidy appearance. But there's something about the eyes and the smile that just draws a person into the painting. There's a, compassionate, patient, forgiving look that seems to say, I see you, I see your sins, I see your problems, I care about you, I long to help you, I want you to know what I have done for you. It's a portrait similar to that which the evangelist Luke paints of Jesus. Luke's Gospel emphasizes that Jesus is indeed a merciful, compassionate, loving Savior. And a verse that has been considered by many people to be the theme verse of Luke is found in chapter 19, verse 10, where Jesus says concerning Zacchaeus, the man who had climbed a tree to see Jesus as he came into Jericho. And then Jesus had called him down and went to Zacchaeus' his home. Jesus said concerning Zacchaeus, for the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. That's why Jesus came. And what a beautiful verse that is, because you and I realize that we are lost in sin. We're doomed by nature. But Jesus came to seek us out. He found us and to save us. These are some pictures from the Gospels that tell us something about Jesus ministry. And if you start up here in the upper left-hand corner, you can see Jesus with the children. You can see children of different races, boys and girls, obviously loving Jesus. And Jesus obviously is loving them. Notice how he puts his arm around this little boy. This little girl has her head on Jesus' shoulder. And other children are standing around looking and thinking about how wonderful Jesus is, how kind he is, how caring he is for us. And that's so true. Jesus said one time, let the little children come unto me and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. That little children is such a beautiful faith. And Jesus said, that's the kind of faith we all want to have. 
Then if you look at the center top picture, you can say Jesus, and perhaps you remember from a couple of weeks ago who this man might be. It is, yes, Matthew, the tax collector. And as you recall, Matthew, being a publican or a tax collector, was really despised by the Jewish people because he skimmed off the top of the tax money that he collected for the Romans and kept it for himself. And so publicans were considered to be sinners. In fact, they put publicans in the same class with every kind of terrible sinner you could think of. And then over here, and you can perhaps see a little bit behind the um, picture of me, the man up in the tree, that's Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus, the Bible says, was not a very tall man. And so he climbed this tree so that he could get a better view of Jesus as Jesus and his disciples are coming into Jericho. Here's Jesus. And Jesus stopped at the tree and he said, Zacchaeus, come down. I need to stay at your house today. And so here was a man that Jesus showed mercy and compassion to. And then lower left corner, maybe you can figure out what this picture is all about. Here Jesus is speaking to a woman who was about to be stoned to death by the Jews because she had been guilty of adultery, of a sinful, immoral lifestyle. And Jesus had said to the Jewish leaders, whoever is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. And nobody cast a stone. And Jesus then came to this woman and showed such compassion and concern and care for her. And he said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And then the lower right picture is of Jesus talking to a woman at the well in Samaria. Now, Jesus and his disciples had come into Samaria, the country between Galilee to the north and Judea to the south. And they stopped at a well, and this woman came to draw water, water with her jar here. And Jesus asked this woman for a drink of water. And John chapter 4 records this whole incident. But what's interesting to think about now is that Luke was particularly concerned about those who were considered to be less than important. And women in Bible times were not considered to be equal with men in many ways. But Jesus loved them and cared for them and was concerned about them. So we can see that Jesus is definitely the merciful Savior. There's some very familiar verses in Luke's Gospel, and perhaps you memorized them when you were back in Sunday school or when you were much younger. And the second chapter of Luke is one that is often heard at Christmas time. It begins with these words over in the lower left hand corner, and it came to pass. In those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And of course, that's what led to Mary and Joseph coming down to Bethlehem because they were from the family of David, and Bethlehem was David's home. And then later in the chapter, chapter 2, we hear about how there were shepherds out in the field tending their flocks by night, and an angel of the Lord appeared to them and said in verse 10, Behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. So the announcement of the Savior's birth. And then lower right, the angel said, For unto you is born this day in the city of David, which is Bethlehem, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And the picture shows maybe Jesus perhaps in a cave. There's one thing that you perhaps notice is not quite accurate about this picture if indeed it is intended to depict the night that Jesus was born because we don't we don't believe that the wise men which you see pictured there were actually there the night that Jesus was born they came up came to see Jesus perhaps up to a year later when they were living in a house of any there's some special features of Luke's gospel two of the best known of Jesus parables are found in Luke's Gospel. The first, the Good Samaritan, the story of how the man, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he was attacked by robbers and beaten and left for dead. And a priest and a Levite came by and didn't stop to help him. But then a man from Samaria, the country where people who were considered to be despised, inferior people by the Jews, the Samaritans, this Samaritan stopped and bound up his wounds and took him to an inn and nursed him back to health. And then the story of the prodigal son. 
sometimes it's referred to as the story of the two sons, because there was an elder son who had some issues, some problems, and then of course the younger son who had taken his inheritance and gone to a far country and wasted it all. But the story shows how Jesus is so merciful and forgiving, even as the father was forgiving to that son when he came home. And then you see pictured here, a man, older man by the name of Simeon, who was holding the baby Jesus in his arms and to his right in the picture is this woman, Anna. And over to the right of the picture, so Simeon's left, you can see a man and a woman, and surely that's Joseph and Mary who have come to the temple. And Simeon said, now let your servant depart in peace for my eyes have seen your salvation. He realized that the baby Jesus was the promised savior. There are four special songs in the book of Luke that are familiar from our liturgy, from our worship service. One is called the Song of Mary, known as the Magnificat, and that's the Latin for the first words that Mary sang. My soul magnifies the Lord, praises the Lord at the birth of Jesus the Savior. And then the Song of Zechariah, known as the Benedictus. Zechariah was the father of John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus and he blessed the Lord that he, the Lord was sending the Savior into the world. And then uh, in Luke chapter 2, the song of Simeon, known as the Nunc Dimittis, and the Nunc Dimittis means, now let your servant depart in peace, now depart in peace. So Simeon, as pictured here, saw the Savior, and now he is ready to die to go to heaven. And then in Luke chapter uh, 2, we have the song of the angels known as the glory and excelsis. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. This is a beautiful painting that depicts somebody that uh, we're gonna get to know very well. And that of course is, is Luke, the author of the gospel of Luke. And I think you can guess which one is Luke. Luke was a physician, he was a doctor. And here he's depicted as a, an older man with a long white beard. And here's a young boy who has injured his arm in some way. Did he perhaps break his wrist? It's a little hard to tell. There might be a splint on the wrist, but Dr. Luke is binding up his arm. And you can see the anxious mother over here, concerned about her son who's been injured, watching carefully. And you can see the compassion in Dr. Luke's face, can't you? You can just see, he seems like such a kindly man, so concerned about this little boy who had injured his arm. Over here is Luke's assistant. Is it maybe his wife even? But she's smiling, trying to comfort the little boy. She's holding a dish for Dr. Luke. And over, over here on the table, you can see some medical devices, a mortar and pestle here. This looks like an aloe vera plant, which was known in Bible times as a, a plant that could provide uh, relief from pain for a burn perhaps, and maybe some herbs up here in the windowsill. At any rate, it shows that Luke was indeed a doctor, and that becomes very important for an understanding of uh, Luke's ministry. And I'll get rid of this pointer in just a moment, as soon as I can. And then we'll move on. It's not letting me do that very quickly. Sorry. There we go. I think. Nope, we're still, we still have the pointer. Sorry. Okay, now we're good. So Luke was a doctor. And Doctors back in Bible times were actually quite well trained. They didn't have as much knowledge as doctors do today. There's evidence that Luke was a doctor from the things that he writes. And there's some beautiful examples. One time Simon Peter's mother-in-law had a high fever. And so Jesus came and touched her and healed her. And it's interesting that Luke describes Simon's mother-in-law as having a high fever. It's like Dr. Luke had put his hand on her forehead and he said, 
uh, she's just burning up. She is so hot. We need to do something for her high fever. As a doctor, we'd be concerned about that. Then there was once a man whom Jesus healed of his leprosy. And Luke is the only one of the gospel writers who says that the man was covered with leprosy. The others just say he had leprosy. But Luke, being a doctor, is going to notice that he is just covered with leprosy. And then when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane with his disciples the night that he was betrayed, and he was praying, and Luke is the one who says that his sweat as he was praying in such agony was like great drops of blood. And so again, it's something that a doctor would be particularly interested in and would notice. Nobody else mentions that there were like drops of blood. And then Jesus touched a man's ear and healed him. Well, that happened in the Garden of Gethsemane too, where Peter had taken his sword and cut off the ear of the high priest servant by the name of Malchus, and Jesus touched the man's ear and healed him. Again, Luke mentions that particular way in which Jesus healed him by touching the man's ear and healed him. Luke is a doctor. So as a doctor, Luke had a very good educational background. He was trained as a physician. And being a doctor involved a fair amount of training back in Bible times too. They had to learn all that was to know about uh, medical um, matters and about medicines and about how to cure diseases. And that good education qualified Luther as an excellent writer too. He was a, a good student, he was a, a scholar. And so he was very gifted at writing as well. Luke, we are going to learn, was also very acquainted with mission work. Luke wrote not only the gospel, but he also wrote the book that in the New Testament that's called the book of Acts. And we'll spend some time with the Acts in the future. But in the book of Acts, he speaks about how he was with Paul on his missionary journeys, some of them at least. And we know that because he uses the word we and us. So he's an eyewitness to many of the things that happened on Paul's missionary journeys. Well, how did Luke gather the information that he used for writing the gospel that we know as the gospel of Luke? Well, he tells us something about that in the very first verses of his gospel, Luke chapter one, Luke begins by saying, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses, servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated, so he carefully investigated everything that had happened from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account. So he investigated it very carefully, and then he wrote a very orderly, very logical, very careful account of the things that happened. Luke later in his life is going to show his faithfulness to Paul. Paul had some physical ailments. We don't know exactly what they were. Some have speculated that maybe he had poor eyesight, or maybe that he was suffering from malaria, or had some other physical disability. And how wonderful it was for the Apostle Paul and his missionary journeys to have his own personal physician right there with him. And so Luke was with him towards the end of his life too, when Paul was in prison. Luke was a very faithful, loyal companion of the Apostle Paul. And throughout his gospel, Luke shows his interest in people. We're going to be looking at some examples of that He's going to show how Jesus is so merciful, so loving, and so caring for people. But Luke, as a doctor, is particularly interested in people, too. Luke wrote his gospel and also the book of Acts to a man by the name of Theophilus. He mentions Theophilus in verse 3 of chapter 1 of, Luke, of the gospel. And it's interesting how he refers to him. He says, for you, I wrote this for you, Most Excellent Theophilus. Now that title, Most Excellent, was used for governors. Governors in Israel, like we hear about in the book of Acts, uh, Festus and Felix, are also identified with the term Most Excellent. 
So some have speculated that maybe Theophilus was a government official of some sort. Maybe he was even a governor somewhere. But the name is very interesting. The name really comes from a couple of Greek words. Theo means God, Phyllis means love, lover. So this man was a lover of God. And people have wondered, was that really his name or was that a name he was given because he had become a believer in Jesus? Well, Luke also says that he talked to many eyewitnesses. Now, there were many people still living at the time of Luke who had seen Jesus, who had heard Jesus, who knew all about Jesus' ministry. And Paul, for example, in 1 Corinthians 15, speaks about 500 uh, believers at the same time saw Jesus. And so he could have, Luke could have perhaps uh, interviewed some of these people and there's another very interesting person that he may have interviewed, and that's the Virgin Mary herself, Jesus' mother Mary. And some have wondered, really, would Mary still have been around when Luke was writing? Well, Mary was probably very young when Jesus was born, and so if Luke is writing in the middle of the first century, Mary could have been perhaps in her early 70s and still be around to uh, tell about what had happened. And maybe that's how Luke got the information for what he records in Luke chapter two, for example. So Luke is really emphasizing that Jesus is the merciful savior. And there are so, some beautiful examples of how he points this out, that Jesus is the merciful savior. In Luke chapter 17, uh, Jesus was uh, dealing with 10 men who had leprosy. Now, lepers in Bible times were considered to be very unclean, and they were required to live in a leper colony apart from everybody else. And if somebody came close, they were to cover their mouths and, and shout out, unclean, unclean, that they were unclean. But Jesus was so compassionate, so caring, that he came to these men and he healed them, the 10 men of their leprosy. Now, lepers were considered to be outcasts. And um, that becomes very clear in this account of the healing of the lepers. Only one of them returned to say thank you to Jesus. The others just went off their merry way, showed themselves to the priest that they were clean. But only one of the 10 came back and Luke records that he was a Samaritan. So he was one of those despised people living up in the country of Samaria. And yet he was the only one that came to say thank you. Lepers were considered unclean by the Jews too. So Jesus was so merciful to them. Then in Luke chapter 15, we learn at the beginning of the chapter that Jesus was speaking to the tax collectors, the, the publicans, people like Matthew, who were considered to be the scum of Jewish society. Nobody had any time for them. Not only was Jesus talking to them, but he was eating with them. Tax collectors and other sinners, Luke says. And in Bible times, eating with somebody was indicating that you were in fellowship with them, that you cared about them, that you were willing to be with them. And so that was very disturbing to the Jewish leaders. In the balance of chapter 15, Luke records three parables. First of all, the parable of the lost sheep. And uh, it's the story of how a shepherd, one of the sheep has gotten lost, so the uh, shepherd leaves the 90 and nine and goes off in search of that one lost sheep. He's not gonna just write it off and say, it doesn't matter, I've got all these other sheep. No, he cares about each sheep, each lamb, so much, he's going to go off and find that one that's lost. And it's just really a picture of how Jesus cares for each one of us. He cares about each individual. It doesn't want anybody to be lost. Well, then the next parable that Jesus tells is about the lost coin. A woman had lost a coin in her house, and so she swept the whole house very carefully, very carefully until she found the one lost coin. And when she found that coin, she was so happy, she went and told everybody that she'd found her lost coin. Well, that's the way Jesus feels about you and me too. He doesn't want any one of us to be lost. He cares about each one of us. 
And then the chapter concludes with the story of the lost son, which we referred to before, the story of the prodigal son, who had asked for his inheritance early, went off to a foreign country, squandered all the money, wasted it in riotous living, and he was ready to uh, even eat the food that the pigs that the pigs were eating. He was feeding the pigs. He didn't eat that food, but he was ready to eat it. And then he said, well, I'm going to go back home and confess my sins, and maybe they'll accept it back home. And he came home, and the father of this prodigal son ran to meet him and hugged him and welcomed him back, and they had a big banquet for him. So it's, again, the, the story of uh, how Jesus cares for each one of us. He loves us so much that even though we're sinners and we deserve only God's wrath and punishment, Jesus came to be our Savior and to take us to heaven. And then in Luke chapter 19, this man Zacchaeus was uh, had planned up in this sycamore fig tree, and he was uh, also a tax collector. So he was considered to be um, disreputable. He probably charged too much, probably skimmed some of the tax money for himself, just as Matthew had done. At least that's what people suspected tax collectors were doing. But Jesus showed his love and his mercy, his compassion for Zacchaeus because he stopped at the tree, looked up at Zacchaeus, and told him to come down immediately because he said, I need to stay at your house today. And it's in this account of Jesus talking to Zacchaeus that the theme verse is found, verse 10, which says, the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. And this is the beautiful truth that Luke emphasizes repeatedly, that Jesus is the merciful Savior. And so we find it again and again. In Luke chapter 18, Jesus tells a parable about the Pharisee and the publican in the temple and the story of how the Pharisee lifted up his eyes to heaven and boasted about himself saying, God, I thank thee that I, I'm not a sinner like everybody else is. I fast twice in a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And I'm not a worthless scum like that tax collector over there in the corner, that publican of the corner. And the tax collector um, beat upon his chest and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. So this parable was intended for those who felt that they were righteous and that they didn't need a savior, looked down on everybody else. They were confident in their own righteousness. Tax collectors like the publican there at the temple were generally despised. And most people assumed that they were far superior to those tax collectors morally. And Jesus perhaps told this parable because he wanted to emphasize that his boundless mercy for other people does not depend upon their social standing or their reputation because he is the savior of sinners. Then another beautiful aspect of Luke's gospel is that he shows Jesus' concern for women. In Bible times, women were often looked down upon as inferior to men. And they had their place in society, but it was not to take any kind of a leadership position, not to speak out of turn. But Jesus showed such love and concern and mercy for women. In Luke chapter 7, we hear about Jesus coming to a little town called Nain. And as he came to the town, there was a funeral procession coming out of town. And the, uh, the funeral was of a young man who had died early and his mother had lost her husband. So she was a widow. And so Jesus stopped at the funeral procession and he raised this young man from the dead. He showed such compassion and love for this poor woman, lost her husband, now her son, her sole support perhaps for her old age. And Jesus cared so much about her that he, um, raised her son from the dead. Then also in Luke 7, Jesus was disturbed um, that, um, that the Pharisees had mistreated a certain sinful woman and the, um, they considered her to be less than um, 
worthy of any kind of forgiveness or care or attention, but Jesus shows his mercy to her. He told her that her sins were forgiven, that she was saved through faith and that she could go in peace. So again, a beautiful example of how Jesus showed compassion and love for a woman. In chapter 13, Jesus reveals his tender kindness toward a crippled woman. When he saw her, he called her forward and told her that she was free from her, her infirmity. So she was suddenly healed of her being crippled. And then he put his hands on her and, and healed her. The um, 23rd chapter is, tells the story of how Jesus showed his compassion for the women who were walking along as he was walking to the cross, carrying his cross. He had been scourged, crown of thorns placed in his head. And the, the women were weeping and wailing, so sad that, that the tragic events that were happening. But Jesus said, don't weep for me, weep for yourselves and for your children. In other words, repent and believe. I'm going to do that which needs to be done for all people, to suffer and die for all people, for you too. So Jesus shows concern for so many different people. And Luke's gospel is just filled with examples of Jesus' concern. And we can just look at a few of them as we uh, consider how Jesus is so concerned. He um, shows this concern for a man possessed by a demon. Um, this man had been possessed and Jesus stopped and healed him, drove out the demon from him. We talked about how Simon's mother-in-law had a terrible high fever and Jesus cured her of her high fever. A man covered with leprosy, we talked about too. A paralytic, a man who was paralyzed, that he could not walk, could not move, Jesus healed him. And his enemies, he showed love for his enemies. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, he said from the cross. And again and again, Jesus shows that kind of love and compassion. The centurion and his servant, the, the centurion was so concerned about his servant who was ill, was, and so Jesus showed concern, not just for the servant by healing him, but also for the centurion, who was a Roman soldier who cared so much about his servant. Another example of, was of a demon-possessed man. Jesus just, his heart went out to him. He cared for him and drove the demon out. The crowds who follow Jesus, he regularly shows his concern for them too, because he sees that they're uh, having problems of various kinds. They have sicknesses, they have emotional difficulties, maybe there's some hunger. So his heart just goes out to people everywhere. A boy with an evil spirit and the, the boy's father, who was so concerned about this son, they tried everything. They couldn't do anything for this poor boy who was possessed by the evil spirit. Jesus showed compassion for both the boy and the father. And then the people of Jerusalem. Um, when he looked over Jerusalem, he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you have killed the prophets and stoned those who are sent unto you. How often would I have gathered your children together, even as a hen gathers? her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. But so Jesus really wanted the people of Jerusalem to repent and believe in him as their savior. Jesus showed concern for little children, as we saw in the picture at the beginning of our presentation. Let the little children come to me and do not forbid them, for such is the kingdom of God. Luke talks about how he showed compassion for a certain rich ruler. And Jesus took the time to actually talk to him and help him understand that he was thinking about his relationship with God in the wrong way. He had put his trust in money and possessions rather than confessing his sins and believing in God and, and the promise of a savior. The two disciples on the road to Emmaus, the night that Jesus um, had risen from the dead, the, the night of the first Easter, Jesus walked with them and he opened the scriptures for them and suddenly they then realized it was Jesus, that Jesus had risen from the dead. But Jesus showed his patience and his love and his concern to these disciples. To the disciples in general, the 11 disciples, he appeared to them um, on Easter Sunday evening, and then he appeared to them again uh, a week later with Thomas present that time. 
and and he said peace be unto you and he's so kind and so caring and so patient with the disciples too even to those crucified he looks down from the cross and he says concerning the jewish leaders and the roman soldiers who are there um father forgive them for they do not realize what they are doing and then even the thief on the cross jesus is crucified between two thieves and the one thief uh, says lord remember me when you come into your kingdom and jesus said to him today you will be with me in paradise so what love and compassion you showed to that thief on the cross too so there's so much evidence that that um, jesus is the merciful savior it's clear in all the different ways that luke especially mentions his pitying love for those who are in need for those who have illnesses who have problems to those who are women to those who are the down, downcast the outcast the publicans and as we think about jesus the merciful savior it helps us to realize that that's what we want to be too we want to reflect that love of jesus to people in our lives and there's a beautiful section in scripture in paul's epistle to the christians in ephesus chapter 4 going into chapter 5 and here's what it says get rid of all bitterness rage and anger brawling and slander along with every form of malice be kind and compassionate to one another forgiving each other just as in christ god forgave you follow god's example therefore as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love just as christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to god so in our dealings with others we want always to be kind and compassionate to them and to forgive them as god forgave us for christ's sake we pray that in the lord's prayer forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and we need to pray that sincerely and then live that sincerely god has forgiven us all of our sins for christ's sake and those as those who are dearly loved by god in christ we want to just live our lives as lives of love and compassion and concern and care and mercy and be willing to give ourselves to others and even sacrifice ourselves for others as christ sacrificed himself for us so luke's gospel is a beautiful gospel that tells us about jesus as the merciful savior it's it's the longest of the four gospels and it has many details that we don't find in the other uh, gospels and it's just filled with love and compassion it's the favorite book of the bible for many people because it just emphasizes the love of god to us in christ jesus well next week we'll take a look at the gospel of john and john is uh, one of jesus disciples of course too one of the three uh, disciples that were with jesus on momentous occasions peter james and john james is his brother and what john is going to emphasize about jesus is that jesus is the son of god he's going to emphasize that jesus is true god become man to be our savior so we we'll look forward to learning about john's gospel and what it tells us about jesus next week <music>